This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody has had an amazing week. Have you? Absolutely. I'm still here. Are you ready for some true crime? I am always ready for some true crime. This story was suggested to us by one of our patrons. Her name is Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. And it's really strange. It's a little different than our normal stories. It's extremely bizarre and fascinating. Who doesn't love bizarre and fascinating? I absolutely do. Me too. Before I start it, I'm going to ask everybody to hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you are listening to us on right now. And with that, I'm going to dive in. Do it. Let's do it. So the year is 2011, and there is this woman. She's 62 years old, and her name is Lois Pearson. Lois lived a very simple life. I mean, it's kind of like a little house on the prairie sort of wow. life, but in, in 2011. In 2011, yeah, really? Yeah, it's really very simple. She lived in a small wooden house that she'd grown up in, in the rural hills of Mineral Wells, which is just outside of Weatherford, Texas. She was a devout Baptist. She'd never been married. She had no children. In fact, she'd never even had a boyfriend or girlfriend. Oh, She lived with her parents her whole life until they passed on, and then she just lived alone. Well, she had a lot of cats. Oh, she was a cat lady. She was a cat lady. I will be a cat lady one day. Once you get a cat. I know. You don't even have a fucking cat. (laughs) I have to wait for my husband to die. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Animals and nature brought her calm while society made her uncomfortable. She would often go days at a time with no human interaction. In her earlier years, she worked as a teacher at an elementary school. But now I guess you would consider her retired. She lived off the meager money she made leasing the 60 acres of property that she had to a man with cattle. And again, when I say Lois was a simple woman, she basically lived off the grid. She had no landline, no cell phone, no TV. And only one lamp in her whole house for light. So she did have electricity, but she only had one light source. Years earlier, her pipes froze, so they burst. And instead of calling a plumber, she just was like, screw it. And decided to start fetching her water daily from the well. What? Yeah. That's kind of... She never got them fixed. Damn. Damn. There were holes in parts of the floor of the house and sometimes snakes and rodents would find their way inside. But that didn't really bother her. Like nope. it would bother me or you. Dude, they would bother the fuck out of me. Oh, hell yeah. Each Sunday, she drove to church in her 1970 Nova. It's a 41-year-old car. <laughs> and if it broke down, she would trek the 20 miles there and back. Once a month, she drove to Weatherford to use a laundromat and get supplies at the grocery store or whatever she needed for the next month. And that was the extent of her travels and her socializing. That was it. Given the life I just described to you, you have to wonder how such an unassuming person could end up being the victim of 12 days of torture at the hands of a murderous monster. Poor Lois. Right? Oh. What the hell? Who is she bothering? Well, let me tell you. It was the middle of the afternoon on March 1st of 2011. Lois was walking out to her Nova, getting ready to head to town for that once a month trip, when a silver Chevy trailblazer pulled into her dirt driveway. She recognized the driver as a former neighbor of hers. He was 58-year-old Jeffrey Maxwell, and she hadn't seen him in over six years. She was wondering, like, why is Jeff here? 
Jeff had purchased a parcel of land to the west of her property back in 2001, 10 years earlier. The first few times she met him, he was really friendly. He was very helpful. He let her borrow a tractor once and helped her out with some plowing in her field to show her appreciation and to give you an idea of how Lois was. She returned the favor by giving him a basket of fresh vegetables and berries that she'd grown in her garden. Jeff took this kind gesture to mean more than it was intended, and he asked her out on a dinner date, which Lois declined. She was completely and utterly uninterested in Jeff. And from what I researched, she wasn't interested in anybody, to be honest. A few months later, Jeff showed up at her house. When she went to greet him, he tried to put his tongue in her mouth. What? She was horrified and she felt insulted. She's like, what the hell? Right. I'm not that kind of girl. Right. And she demanded that he get off her property and never return. For years, he didn't. Then in 2005, he showed up in her driveway to tell her that he was moving. He built this modular home next to the Richland Chambers Reservoir which was roughly 100 miles away. He was just stopping by to say goodbye. Not that Lois even cared. Right, she's probably like good riddance. Exactly. This was the last time Lois saw Jeff until this day, six years later. What the hell was he doing in her driveway? He climbed out of his SUV and he began making small talk with her as if they were old friends. He started drawing nearer But with each step that he went forward, she made one back. There was this look in his eyes that frightened her. A blank stare that felt evil. And the conversation just abruptly stopped. For a few moments, they just looked awkwardly at each other. Then, without warning, Jeff reached into his pocket and he pulled out a bottle of pepper spray. And started spraying Lois in the face. What? This was just the beginning of a very long and very torturous nightmare for this God-fearing woman. Lois was a top cookie. I mean, you can tell. She's fetching her own water from a well. That's pretty badass. I mean, there's indoor plumbing now. I know. (laughs) Yeah, there's this little thing called indoor plumbing. But hey, good for her. She didn't care. No. Lois jetted towards the barbed wire fence that surrounded her field in an attempt to thwart the attack. Just as she grabbed the top of the wire, Jeff wrapped his arms around her waist and he began tugging at her. The barbs dug into the palms and fingers of Lois, but she refused to let go. Her struggle to stave off Jeff was futile. She was no match for the six foot five, 300 pound man. Oh, shit. That's a lot of man. That's a big boy. He dragged her, kicking and screaming, towards the back of her home. In the pastoral woods of Parker County, there was nothing but the cows to hear Lois's cries. Lois was forced inside the back door of her home and into the kitchen. Seeing a rolling pin on the counter, Jeff grabbed it. And he just began beating her over and over again in the head until she fell to the ground. Her eyes started swelling up, but she could see he was holding one of her butcher knives in his hand. He demanded she tell him where she kept her duct tape, but she didn't say anything. Jeff cut the extension cord that was attached to the only working lamp in the house He cut it into pieces, and he used those pieces to bind Lois at the wrists with it. And then he tied her to the doorknob. He went outside, and he grabbed a pair of shackles from a bag in his trailblazer. And this bag could only be described as a kill kit, really. Oh, great. He placed some shackles around her ankles, and, you know, she's bound to this doorknob. He steps back outside. And Lois sees her chance to escape. This petite woman, she managed to slip her wrists from the binds. I mean, it's a court, right? So sometimes there's that leeway. (laughs) She hobbled towards the front door, opened it, and managed to run several hundred yards down her driveway onto the dirt road before Jeff caught up with her in his Chevy. He pointed a pistol at her, and she had no choice but to stop, right? I mean, what's she going to do? Your ankles are 
chained together. You're in a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, and this guy's pointing a gun. Jeff forced her into the cargo area of the trailblazer, and using the duct tape from his kill kit, he ended up putting it around her mouth. He secured her wrists again with some handcuffs that he brought with him. Lois's eyes filled with fear as Jeff leaned in close. He asked her in a very ominous tone, Are you a virgin? Uh. She burst into tears. Then he shut the trunk, put the vehicle in gear, and headed towards the highway. The sun shined bright that afternoon, but no one could see Lois through the Chevy's tinted windows. She considered opening the back of the cab up and rolling onto the highway. Dying on the road seemed like it might be a better alternative than whatever Jeff had in mind for her, but she couldn't find the release button. At this point, she left her fate in God's hands and began praying. Jeff, from the front seat, yelled back at her, quote, When I'm through with you, you won't believe in God. Oh, damn. I know. Oh, shit. They drove almost 100 miles before exiting the highway. After making a few turns, Jeff backed the vehicle into his garage. He lived in that modular house that he had told Lois about six years earlier, near the reservoir in the city of Corsicana. Ever heard of it? Nope. Nope. It's about 50 miles south of Dallas. Through her swollen eyes, Lois could see lawn chairs, tools, and other various objects that make up your average garage. But there was one thing there that piqued her curiosity and her sense of dread. There was this thick steel bar that hung from the rafters by chains. Jeff explained that it was a homemade deer skinning machine, and he intended on using it on her. Oh, no. So you have to imagine there's this beam or a rafter, and there's chains hanging down, and hooked to the chains is this metal rod that's horizontal. Poor Lois. She was stripped naked, and a knife was used to cut her bra off. She'd never felt so vulnerable in her life. Tanya, this is strange, because she's 62. No man... Not even a doctor had ever seen her naked. Not even a doctor? Not even a doctor. She just was a very private person. Wow. Using two pairs of handcuffs, Lois' wrists were attached to the opposite ends of the steel bar. Jeff flipped the switch on a yellow control box, and the metal bar began rising, lifting Lois's arms up into the air. Higher and higher... It raised her until her feet no longer touched the ground, and they were just dangling there. Jeff was taunting her. He began touching her, groping her body in areas no man or woman had ever touched before. He used vibrators and dildos of various sizes to both vaginally and anally rape her. He whipped her. He pummeled her with his fists. Nude, battered, and suspended from the garage ceiling, Jeff then placed clamps on her nipples. Oh, God damn it. I know. What the fuck? It's horrible. It's horrible. The same man who did charity work and was an officer at his local Kiwanis club had spent weeks creating a device that was meant for one thing, to torture Lois. While she hung there naked, Jeff mumbled some really strange things to her. He told her that a group of men had paid him to make her go away, but he would have, quote, done it for free. He intended to keep her alive for maybe two weeks, he thought. Oh, God. And then he was going to kill her. But he was going to wait until his sadistic appetite was satiated first. And it was quite an appetite. At some point during the assault, Jeff exchanged the small whip he had that had some tassels on it for a bigger bullwhip. Oh. And hours went by, and he just kept beating her. He used a fishing pole to do things to her. Every inch of her body was just battered. But his focal point was her breasts. He seemed fixated on her breasts. Lois wondered 
why did he hate her yeah. so much? Was he really stewing for the past six, seven years over the rejection she gave him? It didn't even make any sense. Finally, after hours of abuse, Jeff lowered Lois to the ground, used his little control box, his power box. He helped her up the set of stairs that led from his garage into his kitchen. And then from there, she was led to the bathroom and forced to bathe herself in front of him. The mirror above the sink showed her ghastly reflection. Her right eye was completely swollen shut. Her body was covered in blood and bruises. She began to pray. And Jeff mocked her. He's like, yeah, you better pray. Since her clothes were cut and torn, she had to wear some of Jeff's clothes to bed that night. Jeff took Lois and he chained her ankles to his bed frame. This was her first night in 40 years that she hadn't slept in her own bed. Instead, she was shackled next to a cold-blooded killer who had gotten away with murder at least once and probably twice. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeffrey Maxwell. Before I do, though, I do want to give credit where credit is due. I got most of my information from this really amazing article in D Magazine. The article was called When Lois Pearson Started Fighting Back. I hate it when people rip us off, so I want to make sure everybody knows (laughs) that this is where I got most of my information. I'll go through all the other sources at the end of this episode. But anyway, back to Jeffrey. I call him Jeff. Jeff. Jeff was a very dangerous man, in case you didn't get that from this (laughs) so far. You don't say. He's a psychopath, and he spent most of his life abusing women. He began stealing women's underwear as a teenager. You knew that, right? You knew that was going to be in there somewhere. Yeah, God. Sometimes he would take them while I was burglarizing a home. Other times he would go through his friend's hampers. Like he would be at his friend's house and like sneak through and steal their mom's underwear from the hampers and stuff. dude. He had lots of jobs over the years, but never a real career. He spent some time working as an airline mechanic. He sold feed. Hmm. And he was a prison guard. For the last few years, he'd been living off Social Security disability benefits. What his disability was, I don't know. I mean, I could think of a few things that were wrong with him, but I don't think you get disability right. for that. <laughs> Jeff was married three times. His first and third marriage were to the same woman. Her name was Rita, and they ended in divorce. But his second marriage... That ended in murder. Oh, shit. Jeff met his second bride, 29-year-old Martha Martinez, in the early 1980s through a male matchmaking service. Martha lived with her parents in Mexico, and she was getting close to 30, and she feared basically that she was going to be a spinster. She was really concerned that she wouldn't end up getting married and having a family, so she turned to that matchmaking service. Since Jeff lived in Texas, he was able to visit her relatively easily. I mean, back then, border control was nothing like it is now. (laughs) The first time he met her family, they instantly got creeped out by him. And they told Martha, we don't like him. He visited Martha a few more times before finally proposing. And to the disappointment of her family, she said yes. After the wedding, Martha moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and she began her new life with Jeff, what should have been the honeymoon phase turned into a living hell for her. She kept her nightmare a secret for years, but Jeff couldn't hide his creepiness for very long. Listen to this. This is just bizarre. (laughs) This is like a deal breaker for me (laughs) in my relationships. Jeff was at this family gathering with Martha's family. It was not long after their wedding. He approached his mother-in-law, Martha's mom, and he whispered to her, quote, I guess since we're family now, I get to kiss you. And then he jammed his tongue down her throat. What? Right. Oh, my God. What the fuck is that? I mean, I'm sorry. If my husband (laughs) did (laughs) Did that to your mom. mom? Oh, Lordy. But she wasn't the only unlucky lady to have to fend (laughs) off his advances. Later that same year, Jeff was at a wedding with Martha. And he did the exact same thing to the bride at the wedding. Oh, my God. Poor Martha. (laughs) Man. That's embarrassing. How come he's not getting his ass kicked? Maybe he did. Maybe. I don't know. The union between Martha and Jeff was troubled 
right from the start, <laughs> obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And things only got worse after the birth of their son. Martha's friends began noticing bruises on her ankles and on her wrists. But the true extent of the horror that she was enduring wouldn't surface until 1987. Along Interstate 35 near Ardmore, Oklahoma, a passerby spotted the bound, bloody, and beaten body of Martha on the side of the road. Aww. She was naked. Her throat was cut. But she was alive. She was unconscious, wow. but she was alive. At the hospital, after they stitched her together, she admitted to authorities that her own husband, Jeff, had drugged her, bound her, sexually tortured her, physically tortured her, and then dumped her on the side of the road to die. Authorities searched Martha and Jeff's home, and they found a hidden bag beside the air conditioning unit. In this bag were handcuffs, ropes, clothespins, oh. and I'm sure it's not for laundry. No. Along with a collection of bondage books. Let me tell you some of the titles. Bound, Whipped, and Caged Schoolgirls. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> and Bondage for Three Wives. Jeff was quickly arrested and charged with aggravated kidnapping. What? It that seems really bad. aggravated kidnapping? Why not attempted murder? Exactly. Fearing for her life, Martha and her son fled to Mexico and she was reunited with her family. She finally broke down and admitted all the terrible secrets about Jeff that she'd been keeping from them for years. Jeff was a sadist. On multiple occasions, he had sexually tortured her, and he would leave her naked and tied up in a room, a small room, for days at a time. Oh, my God. Obviously, her family, they were horrified. And they were eager for Jeff to go to prison so Martha could be free of him. Even though he wasn't there, there's still that terror that abused women feel as if the abuser is somehow watching them. And with him in prison, that would help alleviate that for Martha. For a multitude of reasons, Martha felt the police and prosecutors didn't fully believe her story. They made some comments about there not being a lot of evidence. Are you fucking kidding me? She's on the side of the road, naked, beaten, her throat slit. Come on. I'm just reporting. Eventually, contact between Martha and the police and prosecutor ceased. Without her testimony at the trial, the prosecutor had no other choice, I guess, but to drop the charges. Jeff got away with attempted murder. But it gets worse, honey. It gets so, it's, it gets so much worse. In the typical fashion of a domestic abuser, he began sending passionate letters <sighs> of apology to Martha. Girl, don't fall for it. Promising her he changed. Oh, man. And she wants to believe it. Plus, she's Catholic. And oh, he kept God, using the Catholic fuck. card to lure her back. You know, we're married in the eyes of God. You can't get divorced. You don't believe in divorce. Damn it. Now imagine how her family felt when she told them she was moving back to the duplex she shared with Jeff in Fort Worth to give her marriage a second chance. Ugh, my heart breaks. This time, Martha was determined to educate herself to lessen Jeff's grip on her. She's going to educate herself. She's going to get a degree. She was working towards an associate's degree at the local community college. And for a while, Jeff seemed to behave himself. But you can guess, Jeff could only contain his sadistic desires for so long. And on May 10th, 1992, that's Mother's Day, Martha called her family on the phone. She wished her mom a happy Mother's Day. And that was the last time anyone ever heard from the 40-year-old woman again. A few days later, her family received a letter in the mail, allegedly from Martha, saying that she was leaving Jeff after 11 years of marriage, and she wasn't going to take her son with her. The letter said not to expect to hear from her for a while, while she basically got her life together. Now, there was a plethora of reasons this was alarming to them. First of all, Martha would just call. She always just she called them. Second of all, anytime Martha spoke with her family, she spoke in Spanish. Mm. And the letter was written in English. They didn't know if she was forced to write that letter or if someone tried to mimic her handwriting. But they knew that Martha 
didn't just walk away from her son. Martha's brother called Jeff on the phone to ask about Martha, and Jeff hung up on him. Her brother immediately flew from Mexico to Texas. He wanted to file a missing persons report in person. Her family wanted it to be taken seriously and for authorities to appreciate the urgency of the matter, but nothing came of it. Authorities went to speak to Jeff, and he told them that his wife just left. It was strange. She left her social security card behind and her son. To this day, Martha's body has never been found. Years later, when Jeff was asked if he did anything to cause her disappearance, he said, quote, not intentionally. In 1995, Jeff filed for divorce from Martha, citing her abandonment Mm -hmm. of the family. He then remarried his first wife, Frida. Girl, why? She married him not knowing that two days before their wedding, he raped her best (gasps) friend. Oh, my God. Rita's best friend rented the other half of the duplex that Jeff owned. Two days before his second wedding to Rita, she called Jeff and said, the kitchen sink's not working. So he offered to come over and fix it. When he got there, he ended up raping Rita's best friend. And he warned her he would kill her if she told anyone. The second marriage to Rita didn't last very long. Because Rita had two young daughters from a different marriage. And each daughter accused Jeff of molesting Gross. them. One I think she was 13. She said she was playing Nintendo, and Jeff would force his tongue into her mouth (sighs) and touch her. The other child, she was nine. She was laying in bed when Jeff joined her, and he started fondling her. Both girls eventually reported this to school officials. Child Protective Services gave Rita an ultimatum, Jeff or her kids, and she left him. Once again, Jeff got away with these crimes. There were no consequences. And now poor Lois is helpless in the clutches of this brutal monster. And I haven't even told you all the bad things he's done yet to people. Before I get into all that, we're going to take a quick break to listen to our sponsors. We're back, back from our commercial. Lois's sparse interaction with others meant that no one was out there looking for her. And she knew that. That was a consequence of... Keep into yourself. No one missed her. She had no experience with sex and no real understanding of what was going on during the hours and hours he spent forcing her to do things she never even knew people did to each other. Her parents had warned her that kissing boys would give her germs, so she never did. Damn, she never even kissed anybody? No, that wouldn't have stopped me. I can tell you straight off. <laughs> Germs, Germs no. eh, that's it? <laughs> that's fine. During her first night of captivity, she couldn't sleep. I mean, do you blame her? Yeah, no. Every time she dared to look at Jeff, he was wide-eyed and awake. Wow. Watching her, that's yes. just creepy. The next morning, he made her some oatmeal, and he told her that he had to go run an errand. Specifically, he needed more padlocks to keep her chained up. Lois was led back into the garage, which is also what she considered to be her torture chamber. She immediately broke down when she saw that deer skidding rack. She freaked out. She started pleading with him to please, please just don't string her up there again. So he gave her a choice. He pointed to this wooden box that looked and smelled like a freshly built coffin, and he told her she could pick between that or the deer skinning machine. Without hesitation, she chose the coffin. That tells you how bad she did not want to be suspended from the ceiling. Nothing could be worse than being hoisted up to that ceiling, like she'd been the day before. Something resembling a horse bridle was placed in her mouth, and it was secured around the back of her head. Her wrist and ankles were handcuffed, and she was placed in this wooden box. Jeff closed the lid but left it slightly ajar by placing a wrench under the lid so that way he knew she wouldn't suffocate while he was gone. Awfully chivalrous of him. How nice of him. To ensure the security of the box, he placed it underneath a workbench so it would block Lois. if she tried to open it, Yeah, she tried to open it. Once he was confident she couldn't escape, he left to buy more padlocks. 
As the sound of the trailblazer's engine faded off into the distance, Lois began trying to kick the lid off. I mean, she's a fighter. She didn't know it had been moved under the workbench. So when she tried to kick the lid open with her bound legs, the wrench fell to the floor and the lid slammed down shut. Now she was completely in darkness, stifling darkness, trapped alone. I have claustrophobia, so... Just saying it, my heart is racing right now. And I'm trying to think which would be worse. I think one is pain. Yes. Like being suspended. Yes. And the other one is mental right. anguish. Right. And I guess mentally she was stronger than what she could physically handle. I don't yeah, know. maybe. About an hour later, Jeff pulled his Chevy into the garage. And then he opened the lid to the box. Lois was led back into the bedroom. And again, she was just raped for hours. She cried out during the course of it because it was very painful for her. And this only pissed Jeff off. He warned her that if she didn't stop crying, he was going to drag her back into the garage and this time hang her upside down from the deer skinning oh, damn. machine. Lois fell silent. From that moment forward, she decided she would do whatever he wanted to please him because keeping him happy would keep her alive. After the morning round of sexual abuse, Lois's ankles were cuffed to the bed frame. For the next few days, he would only unchain her to rape her, which seemed to be every time he walked through that bedroom door. This pattern continued. Her reclusive life had always given Lois this sense of safety, but now it seemed that it was her downfall. More and more days went by with no one even noticing she was absent. On her fifth day of captivity, Jeff left for some business in Dallas. As I said, it was about 50 miles away. Lois was forced to lay shackled to the bed, which he had now bolted to the floor. Once again, she was gagged with this horse bridle. As hours passed by, she wondered what would become of her if Jeff got into a car accident. Oh, man. Would she just lay there withering away and die like that? It was almost more scary, the idea of him not returning than him returning. The sound of safety was just outside that bedroom window, and she could hear it. It was only a few feet from her, but yet it was so far away. She could hear the cars driving down the street. There was a sound of boats on the lake, and there was a neighbor mowing his lawn. As I said, so close, but so out of reach. Hours later, Jeff came home, and he made fun of Lois for wetting the bed. Just trying to humiliate her. Like she had some other right. choice. Jeff had told Lois that he went to Dallas to pay a repair bill. But that was a lie. He actually drove to Lois's home and burned it to the ground. Oh. He burned her car too. Later that evening, he played a recording he made of the local news story about the arson. He played it for Lois over and over again. He forced her to watch it. All of her earthly possessions were gone, and she could see it. Like in the video, she could see her home on fire. Destroyed was her piano, her mother's sheet music, and all of her family photos. There was no longer a single photo of her father in Aww. existence. Jeff got off on that agony, though. Before he burned her car and her home to the ground, he stole her purse and checkbook. He told her that it was time she start paying her fair share of the grocery bill. By the time firefighters arrived to the scene of Lois's house, it was completely engulfed in flames, and it was a tiny wooden home. So it didn't take much for it to just burn to ashes. Investigators sifted through the debris, and they totally expected to find the 62-year-old woman's remains there. But of course, they didn't. A search crew combed the surrounding area, and helicopters with heat-detecting cameras searched and scanned for Lois. I'm not sure what their theory was. Maybe they thought she was burned and took off injured. But by a few days, they brought in cadaver dogs and they pumped the drains in the nearby ponds. So they were obviously expecting to find her dead. But they still found no sign of her. This baffled the police. And they couldn't help but notice the similarities between this case and the story of Amelia Smith. Who's Amelia Smith? Talia? Well, this is somebody new. I'm glad you asked. 
11 years earlier in 2000, 51-year-old Amelia Smith lived in a trailer in Weatherford, only a few miles away from Lois's home. This was a few months before Jeff ended up purchasing that parcel of property I was telling you about down the road from Lois. Amelia was a deeply religious woman. She was married, she had some adult children, and she worked for a taxi company in Irving, Texas. On February 3rd of 2000, her shift ended at 10 p.m. She got into her car. Now, on this particular night, her husband was away out of town visiting his mom, so she was alone that evening. It was roughly 4 a.m. when neighbors noticed her trailer was engulfed in flames. The entire structure was beyond saving by the time the firefighters arrived. Amelia's car was parked in front of the trailer, and that had been lit on fire, too. But Amelia was nowhere to be found in the wreckage or the surrounding area. And she has never been seen since. She's presumed to be deceased. And only her killer knows where her remains are located today. Now, authorities couldn't find any evidence connecting Jeff to the crime. But he's their number one suspect for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to go and say he did it. (laughs) I'm just going to. He can sue me. Sue me, Jeff. Sue me. (laughs) I'm just saying. I mean, her home was burned down. Her car. Her car. She's missing. I mean, it's in the same town as Lois. Right. It's right down the street. Heck. At a time when he's buying property in the area. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So who knows if Jeff actually bummed into her saw at the grocery store at Stockton. Nobody knows. I mean, he's obviously crazy. Lois and Jeff began to fall into a daily routine of sorts. Gross. He would make her some oatmeal for breakfast, and then he would rape her, and she would spend the rest of her day praying in her head and out loud. She basically repeated over and over again, please, God, don't let Jeff kill me, in front of Jeff, (laughs) which I thought was pretty cool. (laughs) Jeff would mock her. He'd tell her, God seems to have forgotten about you. At one point, though, he did offer her a little bit of a kind gesture. He gave her an old Bible he had in his house. And he actually seemed kind of interested in her faith. He was asking her some questions about her beliefs. It was almost like his mood was shifting, like he was softening up to her a bit. But then he'd go on and rape her for hours again, often with sex toys and Mm. always with chains. On the eighth day of captivity, Jeff developed a fever and chills, and he spent the day in bed. After his recovery, he never ended up raping her again. Really? However, he did demand she write a check out to him for $500 to cover her costs of groceries. I mean, rent's due. Yeah, I mean, you know. You're staying here and it's not for free. (laughs) What? In the memo, she was instructed to write loan repayment. That very same day, Jeff drove to the bank and he cashed the check, leaving Lois chained to the bed frame again. I would like to point out how stupid it is to cash a check. Seriously. From a missing woman's account. (laughs) But he thought he was clever because he had her backdate the check. Oh, so it was written a while ago. Yeah, it was for a loan repayment. Right. So, yeah, I mean, hello. Right. When he returned home, he unchained Lois and he allowed her to sit on the living room floor next to his feet while he sat on the couch. Lois read the Bible and he watched some old Western movies. Lois's mind began playing tricks on her. Stockholm syndrome was slowly creeping in. But it hadn't completely taken over her yet. The next afternoon, Jeff let her go to the bathroom alone. He didn't realize he'd left his cell phone by the sink. Lois knew this could be her opportunity to call 911 and rescue herself. But she had never used a cell phone before. Son of a bitch. I know. She wasn't sure how it worked, but she figured if she messed it up, she'd be hanging from the deer skinning machine. And that was a risk she was not willing to take. So she went back to the living room and just continued reading the Bible. Jeff said to her, do you forgive me for what I've done to you? Of course I do, she replied. That's God's way. I'd been like, fuck you. (laughs) Fuck off. (laughs) He told her, I need to find a way out of the situation. But I don't know how. You just have too many bruises and cuts to just let you go. People would ask questions. And never mind she'd blab. Well, she promised she wouldn't. Oh, she promised she wouldn't. Okay. He thought maybe they could get married. <sighs> and that way she wouldn't have to testify against him. Great idea. But then in his next breath, he said he had to make her go away. 
I mean, he was paid $2,500, he claimed, by a group of men, and he couldn't back down from the deal. With an evil laugh, he pointed to the Bible and reminded her once again, all that praying, it did you no good. March 12th was a Saturday, and it marked Lois's 12th day of captivity. That evening, Jeff was watching a sci-fi movie while Lois prayed next to him in the living room. I told you they had a routine. They were both caught off guard when they heard a knock at the front door. This was the first time anyone had been to that house since Lois had been there. Jeff led Lois into the back bedroom. He went to get the handcuffs, but as he was getting ready to cuff her, there was another knock, but this one was even louder, and it was more urgent. Like, he knew this knock had a purpose. He quickly shut the back bedroom door, and he walked towards the sound of the knocking. He opened the front door, and he peeked his head outside. Standing before him were five police officers. Oh, shit. He mumbled something to them about his house being a mess as he stepped outside onto the porch and closed the door. Officers explained that they were investigating the disappearance of Lois Pearson, and they knew that he'd owned some property next to her years earlier. They acted as if this was just a routine, we're talking to everybody kind of a thing. But the truth is, they learned that he'd cashed a check from Lois And one of Lois's neighbors noticed a silver trailblazer driving down the road after her house was set on fire. And when they found out that Jeff had a silver trailblazer, they're like, ding, ding, ding. As Jeff spoke with the investigators, Lois feared this was the end for her. Perhaps the bad men had come and decided it was time she died. She quietly opened the bedroom door and crept over to the living room window. Looking through the curtains, she noticed the word sheriff on the cars in the driveway. She ran through the kitchen and burst through the front door. I'm here, she yelled out. At first, the officers were confused because this woman looked nothing like the woman in the driver's license they were looking for. Her face was swollen. Her hair was matted. There was blood and grime in it. They asked her, who are you? But before she could even answer, another officer cried out, it's her. That's her. As I said earlier, Stockholm Syndrome was taking hold of Lois. She turned to the officers and said, quote, he didn't do nothing. He's okay. He's my friend, end quote. One of the officers said, quote, well, Lois, you've been beaten up, end quote, and they handcuffed Jeff. With guns drawn, they searched the modular home, clearing each room along the way. Through the clutter and mess, they found some pretty disturbing things. I bet. Jeff had a plethora of assorted chains, locks, handcuffs. There were bloody sex toys laying all around, evidencing Lois's sexual abuse. In the bedroom, the bed frame had handcuffs and shackles. Next to them was an open jar of peanut butter. And I don't have any answers as to why. On the bedroom windowsill was a used container of lube next to a loaded pistol. The dresser was filled with porno magazines and videos, as well as the nightstand and the top shelf in the bedroom closet. He was really into slave fetish movies, and there were stacks of them next to his family photos. Of course, the garage is where the officers were just dumbfounded. That homemade deer skinning machine was enough to send chills down the spines of even the most seasoned detectives. On the ground below it was a sheet, and the sheet was covered in blood. So he obviously wanted to keep his garage floor clean, right? (laughs) which is just ridiculous. There were more whips, cuffs, three guns, four sex toys of various sizes, and duct tape found all around the garage. There were two tall filing cabinets against the wall, and they were filled with bondage porn which included books, movies, and magazines. And of course, let's not forget the handcrafted coffin tucked underneath the workbench. Lois survived her 12 days of terror, and she lived to testify against Jeff at trial. And she gave this amazing interview for D Magazine. Again, that's how I got my information. She was willing to share her story. Wow. The jury took less than an hour to convict him, and they sentenced him to life. Three times over. Damn. Since that time, Lois has tried to put the past behind her. Her church raised $17,000 to buy her a trailer that they put on her property. And they even installed a septic system. That's got to be handy. That's got to be much better. 
Almost every day, someone calls Aww. or stops by her home to check on her. She's learning to appreciate the value of a social support system. And in a quote with D Magazine, she said, I never knew how much I liked people before. Damn. And that is her story. Oh, I'm glad she survived. What an ordeal, though. Fuck. Right. And to this day, nobody knows where Martha yeah. or Amelia's bodies are. Aww. Or what else that little creeper. Wow, Talia. That was a messed up story. Isn't that insane? That's crazy. Yeah. And I just have this feeling that this asshole did many more things that we don't even know about. Oh, I'm sure. He went from zero to 60. You don't do that nope. without something in between, right? So again, I want to thank Rochelle for suggesting this. I want to thank all of you guys for taking time out of your day to listen to Crimes and Consequences. And again, if you haven't done so, I'd like to ask you to hit the subscribe or follow button. That really does help us. Also, make sure to check out our sponsors because that helps us. Yes, please do. You can become a member of our Patreon and get over 100 exclusive ad-free episodes not released to the public. Go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes or go to our website crimesandconsequences.com you can find us on social media instagram and facebook our handles are at hardcore true crime you can subscribe to our apple channel and you get all the same things that you get from our patreon all these exclusive ad free episodes we've got lots of merchandise you can find that at our website oh one more thing before we go crime con oh yeah crime con's coming up and we're gonna be there Las Vegas, April 29th through May 1st. Tanya and I will be on Podcast Row, and we really hope to meet you guys. So if you come to Vegas and go to CrimeCon, come say hello. Please. That'd be we'd, awesome. We'd love to see you. And on that note, until our next episode, don't kill each other. Bye. Bye. Bye.